Hello and welcome to part two of female reproductive pathology. Uh, in the previous video, we reviewed the assessment and treatment of female disorders. Uh, here I'm going to focus on specific female endocrine disorders. <clears throat> we'll start with hypogonadism, uh, Turner syndrome, premature ovarian failure, um, menopause, and PCOS and female infertility. And then in the uh, subsequent video, we'll look at menstrual disorders, uh, PMS, and uh, amenorrhea. So female hypogonadism refers to diminished function of the ovaries, um, and that's gonna lead to diminished function of hormone biosynthesis with low estrogens and progesterone, and typically also will lead to abnormal follicular development. And so often anovulation will be part of that as well. Um, this can be due to primary, oops, not testes, ovaries, uh, primary causes or secondary causes, uh, which would involve the pituitary or hypothalamus. Um, primary hypogonadism would be uh, what we call ovarian failure, and uh, this is also referred to as hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. So that's caused by an impaired response of the gonads to gonadotropins, uh, FSH and LH. Uh, and the treatment typically is with hormone replacement therapy. So this can be either resulting from congenital conditions. Uh, these would be disorders of sex development, DSDs, like Turner syndrome, which I'll talk about here next. Uh, intersex would be uh, genetic females that have had exposure to androgens during the early weeks of gestation, which then give partial male virilizing effects. Uh, Mullerian agenesis, this would be the absence of vagina and variable uterine development. Uh, defects in gonadal enzymes or estrogen synthesis, uh, for example, CAH, and then gonadotropin resistance. So those would be all congenital causes of primary hypogonadism. Acquired would be anything that damages or causes dysfunction to the gonads. So any uh, ovarian disorders. Um, and some of these can be <clears throat> due to uh, autoimmune disease, for example, hemochromatosis, the you know, infiltrative disorders, things like that. Drugs, chemotherapy, antiandrogens, opioids, alcohol, all impair ovarian function, and then endocrine disruptors. Uh, and then from aging, and that would be menopause. So menopause would be an acquired uh, primary hypogonadism. Um, in terms of secondary hypogonadism, this would be, this is also referred to as hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. And this is uh, from impaired secretion of gonadotropins, FSH, LH, and um, this would be uh, treated usually with GnRH uh, agonists or hormone replacement therapy. Uh, so we've seen some of these already with the secondary causes of hypogonadism in males but uh, decreased GnRH uh, would result in decreased FSH and LH, and that happens in Kalman syndrome. Uh, and again, that's associated with anosmia. Uh, there's GnRH insensitivity and charge syndrome. And then acquired causes of secondary hypogonadism would be any sort of brain or pituitary tumor like hyperprolactinemia, uh, head trauma, pituitary apoplexy, uh, certain drugs uh, that would inhibit the pituitary, and then uh, metabolic diseases like diabetes and, again, hemochromatosis. Uh, and then finally, we can have defects in estrogen action, like complete estrogen insensitivity and incomplete estrogen uh, insens insensitivity. So that's the complete list of causes of hypogonadism in females. So now we'll go into a couple of these as examples. So first, let's talk about Turner syndrome. This is the genetic cause of primary hypogonadism. Uh, it results from a partial or completely missing X chromosome. So if all the cells are missing an X chromosome, that's the most common form, about 70%. That would be, be a 45X karyotype. Uh, but some, uh, about 30% of Turner patients have what's called 45X mosaicism. They have some cells that have both X chromosomes uh, and some only have, you know, the 40, the one X chromosome. Uh, so we call that 45, 46, X, X, X uh, karyotype. Uh, unfortunately, with that karyotype, there's an increased risk of germ cell ovarian uh, tumors. So this, uh, if a woman is diagnosed with the uh, 45 X mosaicism, uh, typically the recommendation is to remove the ovaries to prevent any future cancers. Um, loss of the short arm of the X chromosome will result in short stature, and loss of the long arm of the X chromosome will result in amenorrhea and loss of ovarian follicles. Uh, 
Now the features of Turner is that number one, it's not inherited. So the defects occur during early cell division of the embryo. They don't come from the parents. Um, there's no environmental risk that we know. Uh, and the mother's age does not play a role uh, in uh, Turner syndrome. And it occurs uh, between one and 2,000 to one in 5,000 females at birth. So the clinical presentation varies, but typically it includes short stature, a webbed neck. Uh, so that's a pretty classic sign is the webbing on the neck. Uh, low set ears, low hairline at the back of the neck. Uh, more of a triangular facies. Um, and uh, what we call a shield chest, sort of a wide chest with widely spaced nipples. Um, lymphatic cysts in the neck. Uh, this is called cystic hygroma. And then uh, edema often is present in the hands and feet. There could be coarctation of the aorta um, and uh, also pulmonary stenosis and a bicuspid aortic valve. And then there's increased uh, risk of um, kidney abnormalities like horseshoe kidney, etc. Uh, and then an increased risk of hypothyroidism uh, and diabetes, both type 1 and type 2. Uh, typically, Turner, uh, patients with Turner syndrome have normal intelligence. There could be some decrease in nonverbal skills, um, but uh, again, that presentation is going to vary. Uh, but probably the most significant here for the endocrine purposes would be ovarian dysgenesis. Um, often in Turner, we have what's called streak ovaries, so uh, they're just little remnants of the ovaries, and there's no actual sex hormone production. So there'd be lack of genital and pubic hair development, you know, uh, at uh, menarche. And then uh, amenorrhea, especially primary amenorrhea, we'll go into the different types of amenorrhea, uh, would be uh, resulting from that, from the low sex hormones. And then lack of secondary sex characteristics and infertility. Life expectancy, unfortunately, in Turner is often lower, and that's due to the heart defects and diabetes that accompany this. Um, so the diagnosis is usually clinical with our physical signs, um, karyotype testing. There's no bar bodies, um, but this would, uh, if you suspect a patient has Turner, that's what we, what we will send for is a karyotype test and other genetic tests. And then we'll often see high FSH and low LH, and that's due to the decreased estrogens. They don't provide that negative feedback to downregulate FSH. The treatment here is usually involves counseling, estrogen replacement therapy, and potentially growth hormone to increase height. So that's an important uh, one to know uh, in terms of a genetic cause of primary hypogonadism. Uh, that said, we don't tend to see this typically in primary care settings, but if you do work a lot with children, it's something that um, you should keep in mind. So a, an acquired form of primary ovarian insufficiency or primary hypogonadism would be premature ovarian failure, POF. Uh, and this is um, uh, loss of ovarian function before the age of 40. Uh, we see follicle depletion and dysfunction and that leads to impaired ovarian function. Um, FSH is increased, but uh, estradiol is decreased. So the ovaries are not putting out estradiol occurs in up to 1% of women by the age of 40. Uh, it's not the same as natural menopause. So usually after 40, if a woman starts showing lower estrogen function, lower ovarian function, we just kind of diagnose that as menopause. But before the age of 40, it's premature ovarian failure. Um, the age of onset can be as early as age 11 or even birth. Uh, but if a girl never starts her menses uh, and she has the uh, low estrogen, etc then we diagnose it as primary ovarian failure. Okay, so what are the causes of premature ovarian failure? Well, 90% are idiopathic, so we don't know. Uh, most likely a combination of environmental factors, uh, but we do know autoimmune disease plays a role. In fact, uh, patients with uh, autoimmune thyroiditis and uh, Addison's will have an increased risk of premature ovarian failure. Uh, smoking, chemotherapy radiation, infections, pelvic inflammatory disease, for example, ovarian cancer, any infiltrative process like uh, sarcoidosis or hemochromatosis, and ovarian resistance and various enzyme defects. So uh, wide range, but again, the majority of cases, we often never isolate a particular cause. Uh, we do suspect a lot of these environmental causes, uh, things that could tie up maybe some of the enzymes that are needed for the uh, steroidal genesis in the ovaries, etc. Um, 
different genetic causes would uh, be, of course, Turner syndrome, fragile X syndrome, and BRCA1 mutations. Okay, so how would this present? Um, most patients with premature ovarian failure, um, 50 to 75 percent have intermittent ovarian function. So that's actually good news, uh, especially for fertility. So this does not mean that a woman is going to be necessarily infertile having premature ovarian failure. It's just that uh, the chances of conception are a lot less. Um, but she might present, well, typically will present with secondary amenorrhea. Uh, we'll go over the different types of amenorrhea. Um, secondary amenorrhea is when you've already had, uh, you know, menstrual cycles and then they suddenly stop for at least three months. And uh, versus primary amenorrhea where you never develop menstrual cycles. So secondary amenorrhea, so, you know, she's had her cycles maybe through her 20s and suddenly at 32, she stops her menstrual cycles. And usually there's anovulation with that. Uh, infertility is common, but again, 5 to 10% do become pregnant. So that's important in counseling patients that this is not uh, something that will prevent necessarily fertility, but things definitely need to be done to try to augment her chances of conceiving. Uh, there'll be low estrogen, so that might present with symptoms similar to menopause, but more severe. Uh, early osteoporosis is a very common one. Uh, increased cardiovascular disease risk, and then having vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats, uh, again, uh, vulvovaginal atrophy would all be potential signs of low estrogen. Um, other things more commonly associated with this would be, again, autoimmune hypothyroidism, Addison's, and other autoimmune disorders like uh, vitiligo, pernicious anemia, and so forth. And then psychological, this could be... Uh, you know, severely impact a woman's uh, self-esteem, but also if she's trying to conceive with her husband, you know, there can be devastating news that she has premature ovarian failure. So this is where we have to really think, you know, talk about the benefits and uh, or the positive side in that a woman still has the capacity to conceive, uh, especially if we uh, treat this appropriately. So what's the assessment? Well, typically it's history and physical exam. There's going to be amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea, and uh, I'll get into that later, but that's basically having less than nine menstrual cycles a year. Um, and, that's, uh, and this is all occurring before the age of 40. And then signs and symptoms of low estrogen. Uh, typically, FSH will be elevated into the menopausal range. We need to confirm that. And then we're going to find also estradiol is going to be uh, low as well. So our treatment is going to be primarily to, um, you know, the biomedical approaches really address level three and level four. Not a lot of information on level one, level two therapies. But again, here we would want to focus on estrogenic promoting diets, for example, soy, isoflavones, flax, and so forth, um, and all of our other supportive treatments, together with using phytoestrogens and potentially adaptogens as well. Um, interestingly, I've had a couple of patients with premature ovarian failure where uh, phytoestrogen therapies had no effect, but as soon as I added phytoandrogens, um, that's when uh, you know, you know, these patients started having their menses again. So uh, that was something that was interesting. Um, and then different nutrients uh, that are we think are important, especially the B vitamins, but also iron, copper, zinc, magnesium, for proper ovarian function. Uh, typically, the, if there is uh, evidence of osteoporosis or significant changes from the low estrogen, we're gonna recommend hormone replacement therapy, especially if the level one, level two therapies maybe have not been effective after six months or so, uh, then either refer on to gynecology or maybe initiate the replacement therapy. So estrogen uh, plus progesterone would be the typical things, and that's going to decrease osteoporosis and vasomotor symptoms, decrease the cardiovascular risk and stroke, decrease the urogenital atrophy, and decrease cognitive decline and dementia. Uh, again, there are risks, and I went over those uh, in the previous video. The goal is to give these up to the age of 50 to 51. And uh, typically, we give that continuously transdermal estradiol or a vaginal ring of estradiol. And then for the first 12 days of the month, giving micronized progesterone or the medroxyprogesterone acetate uh, to uh, allow for withdrawal bleeding. So in oral contraceptives here are also sometimes an option. We think the way the oral contraceptives work, especially for fertility, 
is to um, sensitize the granulosa cells in the follicles to the FSH. Uh, so that sometimes is used as part of the fertility treatment with premature ovarian failure. Um, level four therapies would address some of the symptoms of uh, low estrogen. So one of the emerging therapies for vasomotor symptoms are using SSRIs, antidepressants, and SNRIs. Uh, some even use gabapentin. This is not an approved use, but um, definitely that uh, I've seen that in some of the prescription plans. Uh, but SSRIs, SNRIs, these are basically working by just, you know, working with the serotonin chemistry and the norepinephrine and uh, helping more with the mood changes that might occur from low estrogen. Uh, cardiometabolic might involve blood pressure, lipid, and glycemic control, depending on the patient's labs. And then osteoporosis might involve using serms or bisphosphonates as therapy. So that's the approach to premature ovarian failure, not that uncommon, and a very common cause of secondary amenorrhea in the clinic. So an age-related cause of uh, primary hypogonadism would be menopause, and this is the cessation of menses for a minimum of 12 months as a result of cessation of follicular development. So the follicles are no longer responding to FSH and LH. Uh, typically occurs between the ages of 49 to 52. Uh, it's the opposite of menarche. And it's a natural change, again, usually due to ovarian fatigue. Uh, and for ovarian fatigue, by definition, is where the ovaries no longer respond to FSH, LH. Uh, the ovulation stops, menstruation ends, and the blood levels of estrogen and progesterone gradually decline. Um, remember that the levels of estrone, E1, tend to go up, estradiol tends to go down. The date of menopause in a woman with an intact uterus is the day after the final episode of menses, but we often don't know that. Uh, we have to wait actually for one year. So um, we actually have to wait a year, and then after t 12 missed periods, we can say, okay, a woman's in menopause. The day of her menopause was actually the first day after her first, uh, her final episode of menses. We define premenopause as the years leading up to menopause. Perimenopause is the menopause transition years, usually about six to 10 years. And then postmenopause occurs one year after the date of the last menses. So those are just some little definitions you sometimes see that can get a little confusing. Um, hormone changes in menopause, we're gonna see elevated FSH and LH. Uh, some sources suggest that that's what initiates the vasomotor symptoms, uh, but it's not clear that that alone is sufficient to induce hot flashes. Um, the LH, increased LH, stimulates the ovarian stromal cells and they start producing an androgen, androstenedione, and that gets aromatized peripherally via aromatase to estrone. So the estrone is largely coming from the high levels of androstenedione uh, being created through the elevated LH. Uh, so estrone becomes the dominant estrogen. Uh, we might see hirsutism that develop due to a decrease of the estradiol to androgen ratio. And um, so that is not uncommon after menopause. Uh, causes, most common is age, could be due to premature ovarian failure, um, but again, that would be before the age of 40. So depending on how strict you are with definitions, that would technically be POF and not menopause. And then surgical menopause would be when, for example, the ovaries are removed um, with a hysterectomy. Um, the clinical presentation involves vasomotor instability, so hot flashes, flushes, um, and uh, again, they're associated but not necessarily caused by the surges in LH. Um, they're characterized by blood vessel dilation, a feeling of warmth, skin redness, sweating, and palpitations. In Chinese medicine, these are referred to as deficiency heat versus a true inflammatory heat. So if you put a thermometer in someone, they're not actually getting a fever, but they certainly feel and they're having all the systemic sort of changes that go along with uh, that. Um, mood changes with fatigue, irritability, headache, <clears throat> anxiety, depression, insomnia, decline of sex drive, memory loss, and problems with concentration are also common. Um, something I that's an area of research that I didn't spend a lot of time discussing was the effects of estrogen on the brain. I talked about serotonin and the fact that estrogen has a protective role. Well, one of the ways we think it protects is by decreasing amyloid deposition, and uh, that can prevent, you know, with part neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's have a, uh, 
an anti-dementia effect. And uh, so one of the long-term things we see with low estrogen is potentially increased uh, amyloid and dementia associated with that. Uh, urogenital atrophy, this uh, lack of estrogen has a profound effect on the lower genital tract, including thinning of the squamous epithelium in the lower genital tract, causing dyspareunia, painful sexual intercourse, uh, decreased cervical, vaginal, and labial mucus, <clears throat> and increased vaginal pH, which would increase susceptibility to vaginal infection, uh, decreased pelvic tone with urinary incontinence, and that's specifically stress incontinence. Remember, with incontinence, we have stress incontinence and urge incontinence. Uh, stress is actually from a weakening of the pelvic floor muscles, uh, usually due to low estrogen. Urge is more related to a nervous system problem, overactivation of uh, the nerve activity. Um, collectively, all of these uh, symptoms are referred to as the genital urinary syndrome of menopause, GSM. I talked about that before. There are changes in the skin and soft tissue with breast atrophy, breast tenderness and swelling, decreased elasticity of the skin and skin thinning and drying. Um, formication is, uh, uh, formication sorry, is an interesting uh, symptom. This is the sensation of like small insects crawling on the skin. So itching, tingling, burning, pins and needles. And that can be all over the body or I've also commonly, women have described it more in the pelvic area and the groin. So that could be a sign of low estrogen. Uh, osteoporosis, estrogen is needed for proper bone development. I've talked about this before in the physiology section. Um, so uh, estrogen inhibits the osteoclasts whereas the androgens progesterone uh, seem to stimulate the osteoblasts, so all of them have a role in proper bone development. Uh, but we see more thinning and brittleness of bones and more bone fractures uh, with uh, low estrogen states. And then in, in, there's a risk of cardiovascular disease increasing. So before menopause, a woman's risk of cardiovascular disease is the same as a male's. And uh, I'm sorry, lower than a male's. And then after menopause, it's the same as a male's. Uh, and we think that's because of the loss of the protective function of estrogen. So we see a rise in LDL, uh, a decrease in HDL, decrease in endothelial function, and increasing cardiovascular disease risk. Um, so that's typically, you know, treated in the conventional circles with statin drugs, uh, those kinds of things. Um, people use natural products to lower cholesterol. I find using phytoestrogens is sometimes something that's helpful there. Uh, so phytosterols and phytoestrogens, uh, these actually I've seen in some postmenopausal women with high cholesterol be the most effective therapy for them. Okay, so that's a little the clinical presentation of menopause. How do we assess menopause? Well, largely through history and physical exam. We find all the clinical signs and symptoms that we just went through. Uh, labs are really not routinely used uh, to diagnose menopause specifically, but we might use them to look at a lipid panel and your uh, blood sugar levels and so forth. Um, we'll see an elevated FSH LH, but that's not necessarily indicative of menopause. So we, we don't just routinely measure that uh, if we suspect menopause. We might look at hormone testing to confirm the low hormones, estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone. Uh, and especially if we're gonna get a baseline before using HRT, it's important to get those hormones measured. Uh, and then we'll wanna look at labs at a woman's cardiometabolic risk with a lipid panel, hemoglobin A1C, and then calculate her ASCBD risk, uh, her 10 year risk to see where we're at there. Uh, remember, ASCBD risk of over 10%, it's going to uh, pretty much contraindicate uh, using any sort of HRT with her until those risk factors are decreased. Uh, imaging tests that are commonly done at menopause would be a DEXA scan to look for the bone density, and then mammography especially, and those need to be repeated frequently about every two years if a woman is on the HRT. So the treatment level is gonna depend on the severity. We typically start at level one, level two, as I mentioned, but if there's evidence of severe mood changes, um, you know, cardiovascular risk or osteoporosis, we might need to jump to level three and level four. So um, pretty much the same in terms of level one, level two as premature ovarian failure. Uh, high, flat, high lignin foods, uh, soy foods, et cetera, might be part of our diet changes here emphasizing anti-inflammatory and maybe a cardiometabolic protective diet like the Mediterranean diet. 
with lots of olive oil, um, you know, high fiber with lots of vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, etc. Uh, level two would be focusing on, you know, using uh, as a starter therapy, maybe phytoestrogens. But again, maybe looking at, is she having an overactive HPA axis as well? Maybe using sedative adaptogens or nervines. Um, so you gotta sometimes think a little bit outside the box and then there might be a need for phytoandrogens as well. Again, in Chinese medicine, phytoestrogens would be yin tonics, phytoandrogens would be yang tonics, uh, nervines would be herbs that settle the shen. Uh, so these have different names and different traditions, but we're really talking about the same thing. Um, in terms of replacement therapy, again, I went through that already, so I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna quickly review it here. Um, if a woman is gonna receive replacement therapy, we've gotta determine which hormones we're replacing. Um, and the sample regimen might be a transdermal estradiol, 25 to 50 micrograms a day, um, or the Premarin, 0.625 milligrams a day, and then either cyclic or continuous progesterone, and preferably the oral micronized progesterone. Um, the benefits of HRT would be, again, uh, decreased hot flashes in the genital urinary uh, symptoms, uh, decreased osteoporosis uh, risk in the spine and the hip, and then decrease LDL and total cholesterol. Uh, but the risk would be increased cancer, breast and endometrial uterine, increased cardiovascular disease risk like MI stroke and deep vein thrombosis, especially with longer term therapy, uh, and especially with oral preparations, and then increased gallbladder disease risk. Uh, and the contraindications we um, uh, have already looked at before, so you can, you can go through that. Now, the risk really is going to be increased with hormone replacement therapy the longer after menopause that HRT is initiated. So we really want to think of using HRT only shortly after menopause for maybe a few years, and that's it. Uh, I see women in, you know, in their late 60s that are still taking estrogen progesterone. And that's really when we start to see more of the problems arise from the clinical studies. Um, some of the common uh, bio level four treatments would be identical to what we saw in the uh, premature ovarian failure. So SSRIs, SNRIs for vasomotor symptoms, uh, and then addressing cardiometabolic risk with the classic BP meds, lipid control, glycemic control, and then serums and bisphosphonates for osteoporosis. Okay, so that's a little there on the treatment for menopause. Again, think maybe about starting at level one, level two. This is not, you know, we talk about menopause as a condition or some sort of disorder. This is a natural transition. So generally it requires a natural transitioning through diet changes, maybe some lifestyle changes, uh, herbal therapies and so forth. Um, and so the need for the replacement therapy and whatnot, although we tend to use a lot of it, um, uh, really, uh, I think has less of a role as if we focus on these first two levels first. Now, a lot of people, when they hear HRT and menopause, they have, uh, you know, they've heard a lot of things in the media about the negative effects of HRT. And I wanted to kind of go through that just quickly here. So um, in 2002, there was a study called the Women's Health Initiative, and it looked at the effects of combination therapy of Prempro. So it looked at Premarin plus Provera. Remember, Premarin is the conjugated equine estrogens, the horse estrogens, and Provera is the medroxyprogesterone acetate. So Prempro is the combination. And um, they found um, uh, disparate results for all-cause mortality with HRT. And they actually stopped the study early because the risks were far outweighing the benefits of the therapy. So after they did that, it got into the press, taking estrogen replacement is a bad thing and people stop using it. And the, and the use of uh, hormone replacement therapy dropped considerably after this. Uh, they did find in the studies the benefits, again, were with reducing hot flashes and vaginal dryness, uh, decreasing osteoporosis, and decreasing the risk of colorectal cancer. But uh, we did see an uptake in the signal for breast cancer and for cardiovascular disease. So MI, stroke, and deep vein thromboses with pulmonary embolism dramatically increased with the uh, Prempro treatment. Um, now, the risks, importantly, were greater in patients over 60 and they were lower in patients over 50 to 59. So people, researchers have gone back and analyzed the data, and uh, it turns out that the adverse effects are more minimal than previously thought, especially in that younger age group, 50 to 59, and even up to 70. 
And then after 70, we start to see the signal go up considerably. Um, in 2003, there was a meta-analysis of 30 randomized control trials on menopausal HRT in relation to mortality. And it showed that HRT was associated with a nearly 40% reduction in mortality in trials where the mean age was less than 60. So again, we're seeing an age-dependent effect here. Uh, a lot of the people in the 2002 study were, were women that had gone through menopause, were not given anything for over a decade, and then suddenly were restarted on the PremPro. So that is not a natural progression of how our hormones work. Um, combination therapy after menopause is typically associated with significant improvements in all aspects of postmenopausal sexual dysfunction. So it improves libido as well as vaginal lubrication, orgasm, diminishes sexual pain, as well as the mood and cognitive function. Um, and um, part of that's through decrease in the amyloid deposition and preventing uh, deterioration of acetylcholine, so helping with memory and so forth in the hippocampus. So this was, these are all the benefits. Um, and uh, so since then, the word has kind of gotten out, well, HRT actually has a role. Uh, some people have questioned, should we be using conjugated equine estrogen and synthetic progestin? Why not just use the bioidentical hormones? And so you see that a lot out there in the popular press that, oh, well, this study only looked at these synthetic hormones or semi-synthetics or animal-derived. They didn't look at the natural hormones. So you're safe with the natural hormones. The FDA has been very clear that um, based on this data, we can't really say natural hormones are safer. Uh, we have to take the same risk considerations to heart. But again, the data, even with the conjugated equine estrogens and MPA, suggests that if you use the estrogen hormone replacement uh, you know, right after menopause for just a few years, the benefits far outweigh the risks. And so uh, the risks are not zero, but we can be safer and we can be more confident in using it in that time span. So that's hopefully gives you a little perspective on hormone replacement therapy and um, you know where we have a more nuanced picture than it just being bad for everyone. There is actually a role for it and we have to literally look at a woman's age, her cardiometabolic risk, and so forth. Now with premature ovarian failure and menopause and turners, we've been talking about hypogonadism. I just want to say one condition associated here with hypergonadism is polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS. Um, there's been, this used to be called Stein-Leventhal syndrome. There's been some discussion that we should actually change P PCOS to another name because uh, it turns out that only about 70% of women uh, with PCOS symptoms or that meet the criteria for PCOS actually have problems in the ovaries. Another 30% probably have adrenal issues. And um, so it's more of a systemic metabolic problem, not just an ovarian problem. Um, but in general, PCOS is associated with elevated androgens uh, in females. And um, with androgen excess, you get ovulatory dysfunction and you also get polycystic ovaries, but not always. Uh, these cysts are actually follicular cysts that are stopped early in their development. So they don't go through their full you know, year of development uh, for them to become a mature graphene cyst. Uh, so they stop somewhere early in that development and they become fluid filled and they often align along the outside, the cortex of the ovary, and they look like a string of pearls on ultrasound. So that's where the word polycystic ovary came from, is that appearance of these follicles. But that's due to the uh, usually high androgens, low estrogens, low FSH, uh, which is um, contributing to this. It's the most common endocrine disorder in females, 18 to 44. Uh, again, it was first described by Stein and Leventhal in 1935, which is why it was given the name Stein-Leventhal syndrome. And it's one of the leading causes of infertility. There's no cure, but it can be managed uh, pretty effectively. And uh, if you understand what's actually happening. So the classic clinical presentation is menstrual disorders due to chronic anovulation. Uh, usually they present around the time of menarche. Uh, and unfortunately, with continued, uh, so if you have oligomenorrhea, less than nine menses a year, uh, you're going to get, still get that estrogen stimulation, and that is going to proliferate the endometrium, so there's an increased risk of endometrial cancer. Um, so we can have either secondary amenorrhea, so no menses for three or more months, um, and or oligomenorrhea, uh, 
or uh, also with that, hypermenorrhea. So when a woman has a menses, it is very heavy and prolonged. Um, so that's one issue is menstrual disorders with PCOS. So typically oligomenorrhea or uh, secondary amenorrhea, uh, infertility due to anovulation, and then hyperandrogenism. Um, and uh, this often, if it uh, occurs early enough in life, might result in a premature adrenarchy uh, to occur. So premature pubic hair growth and so forth. Um, so it can be mild with acne, hirsutism, androgenic alopecia, or it could be severe, and it's called hyperthecosis. This is thickening of the thecal cells in the uh, ovaries. And here we get things like clitoral megaly. So remember the clitoris really is a, analogous to the glans penis in a, in a male, and this is very responsive to androgens. And so it will grow in response to the high androgens, uh, increased muscle mass, a deepening of the voice. Um, now, when it's severe, this suggests it might be more than just a, an ovarian problem. This could be androgens from somewhere else, like CAH, uh, any androgen secreting tumor, exogenous androgens that are given, uh, you know, if there's a transdermal androgen being applied or something. Um, and here, typically, we see the very severe hyperandrogens, and we're going to screen for things like CAH. Uh, by measuring the 17 hydroxyprogesterone levels as a marker for that. So that's the third thing that presents with PCOS. Metabolic syndrome is uh, common as well in up to 70% or more of cases, and that involves central obesity. Uh, that's, again, a BMI of over 30. Uh, insulin resistance in up to 70%. Diabetes type 2 uh, is going to be in about 10% of patients. Cardiovascular disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, acanthosis nigricans, which is a sign of uh, uh, you know insulin resistance and high sugar in the skin, and then obstructive sleep apnea. Um, for women, the criteria of metabolic syndrome are abdominal obesity over 35 inches, having a triglyceride level of over 150, or an HDL uh, less than 50. Elevated fasting sugars, 100 milligrams or higher. If it's over 126, of course, that indicates diabetes. Elevated blood pressure, over 130, over 85. A pro-inflammatory state with elevated CRP or pro-thrombotic state with PAA1 or fibrinogen level activation. So these last two aren't part of official criteria for a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome, but they're often there as well. So this is um, where many PCOS cases are associated with metabolic syndrome. And then finally, we might see on ultrasound enlarged or polycystic ovaries. Um, they may or may not be present, and, uh, but they would be observed on ultrasound. So what's the pathophysiology here? This is a very complex metabolic condition, similar to cardiovascular disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome. It's a combination of genetic and, and environmental and dietary factors, we think. Uh, so genetics play a role. We know H, there's an HPG uh, axis dysregulation, usually with increased LH or increased LH sensitivity in the ovaries, and that allows for more of that androgenic stimulation in the fecal cells. Uh, insulin resistance, um, the effect of insulin. So again, this is not going to be 100%, but up to 70% of patients with PCOS have insulin resistance. The insulin stimulates fecal cell secretion of androgens and also inhibits sex hormone binding globulin production. Uh, and uh, that's partly because it decreases the estrogen ratio. So now we get uh, increased total androgens. So think of insulin as sensitizing the fecal cells to the effects of LH, and we get more androgens. So insulin tends to promote androgen production in the ovaries. Uh, and obesity, whether that's a cause or a consequence, is not known. Um, so there's really two types of PCOS. There's the ovarian type, that's up to 70%, with increased testosterone. So we have uh, androstenedione. A lot of that converts to testosterone. So we get high testosterone, androstenedione and insulin resistance. And there's an adrenal type, about 30%, with high DHEA and HPA axis dysregulation. Remember, ACTH releases not, from the pituitary, releases not just uh, uh, cortisol from the adrenals, it also releases DHEA. So any HPA axis dysregulation from stressors, etc., can actually cause that as well. So that is a second type, and some of the literature is now beginning to tease out these two and saying they're really two separate types. But for most of the resources right now, they just lump them all together. 
uh, which is why some of the therapies work for some PCOS patients and some don't, because most of the therapies are aimed at, right now, addressing insulin resistance. Uh, but not all PCOS patients uh, will have that. So what's the assessment of PCOS? Well, there's several guidelines that exist. The most common one uh, that we use clinically is the Rotterdam criteria. This was established in 2003. Uh, we need two out of three criteria to diagnose PCOS. So either the presence of oligo or anovulation, and that would be usually through uh, uh, amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea, uh, clinical and or biochemical signs of hyperandrogenism like acne, hirsutism, et cetera, and polycystic ovaries by ultrasound. So you need two out of those three. So if a woman comes in with uh, not having a period in five, six months with lots of acne, she meets the criteria for PCOS. Um, she doesn't have to have polycystic ovaries on the ultrasound. Now notice that insulin resistance is not a criteria. Um, a lot of people confuse that. So it's either the oligo and or anovulation. Again, clinically, the, the way we see that is either oligo or amenorrhea, oligomenorrhea being less than nine menses a year, um, or the clinical and or biochemical signs of hyperandrogenism, and then the polycystic ovaries. So two out of those three. Um, now we gotta think of a lot of other conditions in the workup of PCOS, so rule out thyroid problems. You could do that with the TSH. Uh, rule out non-classic uh, uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And that's due to the 21-hydroxylase uh, deficiency, and you can measure the 17-hydroxy progesterone in the morning. And if the levels are over 200 nanograms per deciliter, that kind of confirms that. You need to check prolactin. So rule out, uh, check your morning prolactin levels. Um, look for uh, androgen-secreting tumors if the testosterone is high. So if we suspect a lot of, a lot of androgen symptoms, get a serum testosterone. And if it's over 150, um, nanograms per deciliter, um, then we want to start to think about maybe an androgen secreting tumor that's present. Um, the uh, adrenal tumors will secrete ex excess DHEA, and that could be over 800 micrograms per deciliter, and that would give a low LH. Um, Cushing syndrome, we would do that with a 24 hour uh, cortisol, urine cortisol test check for that and then acromegaly we can check IGF-1. So typically we're going to, you know, use our clinical findings to kind of gear, you know, maybe tell us we need to look down one of these routes, but this would be part of the differential diagnosis. So our history and physical exam, we're going to use the Rotterdam criteria, look for any signs of hirsutism, virilizing signs, the acanthosis nigricans, uh, in indicating insulin resistance. And then um, always, if a woman has amenorrhea, even if she says it's unlikely that she's pregnant, it's a good idea to get a pregnancy test just to make sure that's not the cause. Um, but we wanna get a hemoglobin A1C and maybe a fasting blood glucose or a two hour oral glucose tolerance test. Um, those would all be workups for dysglycemia. A lipid panel to check for her cholesterol, lipids, TSH, prolactin, FSH, a, a testosterone, total and free, DHEA, and then liver enzymes looking for NASH uh, specifically. So that would be some of the common labs we'd give. Less common would be the 17-hydroxyprogesterone if we suspected CAH in a younger woman, 24-hour uh, free cortisol if we suspected Cushing's, and a serum IGF-1 to rule out acromegaly. Transvaginal ultrasound is helpful, especially to look at endometrial thickness to make sure it's not proliferating too much uh, and obviously to look for any evidence of endometrial cancer. And then uh, CT or MRI, if we suspect a tumor in the ovaries or the adrenals, maybe hypersecreting androgens. Um, we might get a PHQ-9 to look for depression, a GAD-7 for anxiety, and then sleep studies. So these would all be some of the common workups and assessments for PCOS. What's the treatment? Well, the treatment really is to decrease androgens, um, to decrease the cardiometabolic risk and improve insulin resistance, and uh, prevent endometrial hyperplasia and carcinoma. Uh, maybe contraception for those who are not pursuing pregnancy and ovulation induction for those pursuing pregnancy. So these would all be some of the goals of treatment. Um, so the level one treatments would be like we've seen before, emphasizing you know healthy diet, uh, 
but maybe increasing our flax to increase sex hormone binding globulin that would tend to bind up uh, more of the androgens. Uh, exercise, lifestyle, all of this would be to decrease cardiometabolic risk. Uh, level two therapies, the typical recommendations in the more functional and naturopathic circles are to use insulin sensitizers like myo-inositol, um, dechiro-inositol. So when people just say inositol, they mean myo-inositol. Uh, dechiro is a more specialized form of that. And some of the sources say you want a ratio of 40 to one of the myo to the dechiro-inositol, ideally. Uh, Alpha-lipoic acid, acetyl-L-carnitine, berberine, chromium, vanadium, vitamin D3. These are all used in diabetes treatment to improve insulin resistance. Again, this would not be as helpful in the 30% of, of, of women who have the adrenal PCOS. And there you might want to think about more sedative adaptogens <clears throat> um, to work with that. Or uh, insulin sensitizers, or maybe giving liver support or phytoprogestins. So uh, it's going to vary depending on the patient. Uh, typically, uh, with uh, level three, level four therapies, uh, what's given for hyperandrogenism is to do a low dose oral contraceptive, uh, an E2 with progestin, like ethanol estradiol and norgestimate, um, to decrease. Uh, this helps to decrease FSH and LH, so it provides negative feedback to the hypothalamus, decreases the gonadotropins that's gonna decrease the ovarian androgens and hopefully increase sex hormone binding globulin. Uh, the risk, of course, would be with any estrogen-containing product, the risk of venous thromboembolism and so forth. Um, usually, if that hasn't improved the case in six months, spironolactone, which is an androgen antagonist, is added. Uh, and then maybe metformin for addressing insulin resistance up to 2,000 milligrams a day and then doing your blood pressure and lipid control, and then clomiphene used for ovulation stimulation. So those are more the biomedical approaches of PCOS. I work with a lot of PCOS patients in the clinic, and uh, we find that level one and level two therapies can be very effective. Uh, but again, you need to identify whether or not this is more the ovarian insulin resistant type or the adrenal type. Okay, so that's a little summary of PCOS and maybe how to think about that clinically. Finally, I want to say a few words here about female infertility. Um, so infertility is the inability to become pregnant after one year of intercourse without contraception. Uh, we've already looked at male infertility. Um, so kind of the current guidelines suggest anywhere between 20, even up to 50% um, uh, of infertility in couples has to do with male factors. These are problems in the semen. Uh, female infertility accounts for about 20 to 35%. Uh, of the uh, infertility cases, and that re is resulting from anovulation or other pelvic disorders. Uh, and then we think there's a combined 25 to 40 percent between also ma both male and female factors. Uh, and then about 10 to 20 percent of cases we just don't know. It's unknown. So about 15 percent of reproductive age couples experience infertility or subfertility. Uh, the most common causes of anovulation which is a very common cause of female infertility, would be pregnancy, um, obesity, pituitary problems like HPO axis uh, dis abnormalities, um, increased prolactin, uh, hypothyroidism, having either Cushing's or Addison's, so either end of the adrenal spectrum, um, having premature ovarian failure or PCOS, uh, and then different eating disorders or very competitive athletics can create what's called hypothalamic amenorrhea. I'll talk about that here in the next uh, video series. So that is um, some of the causes of anovulation. So in general, we can look at uh, the causes of female infertility as either being genetic, and I won't go through those, but that would be like Turner syndrome, the CHARGE syndrome, GNRH insensitivity, et cetera. Uh, acquired factors from AIDS or tobacco smoking. We're not sure about cannabis smoking. Again, one of the things that tobacco smoke does is it decreases the cilia, cilia movement in the fallopian tubes, um, and this can result in infertility. We're not sure if cannabis does the same thing or not. Um, body weight, either over or under, um, and then different environmental factors. And then lots of neuroendocrine factors, which is what I try to focus on in the clinic with infertility. So what's her sleep cycle? What's the stress level? Um, what's going on with prolactin? What's going on with thyroid? Uh, insulin resistance, PCOS, 
what's going on with her androgens and her estrogen progesterone. Um, pelvic ovarian factors would be things like ovarian insufficiency or failure, pelvic adhesions, such as after surgery, uh, after chemo radiation, pelvic inflammatory disease due to STIs. Some women make lots of anti-sperm antibodies, and that's a challenging one to treat. Um, uterine disorders, endometriosis, and the cervical vaginal factors. And then different organs, like uh, there's a high connection with celiac disease and infertility. And that has to do with probably the lack of nutrient absorption. And then IBD, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, and then liver and kidney disease. So typically we're gonna, in a couple that presents for infertility, we're gonna work up both partners. Um, the male partner should get a semen test and we went through all that with the male infertility section. Uh, I'm gonna do a full history and physical exam with a pelvic exam and a pap smear, get a basal body temperature. That should actually increase at ovulation um, by about a half degree. Um, and then get uh, most likely an endometrial biopsy to get the status of uh, the endometrial lining. And then common labs would be CBC, CMP, check for anemia, other, other issues. Uh, pituitary function would be assessed through FSH, LH, and prolactin. We get a TSH from thyroid. And for fertility treatments, the idea would be one to two uh, milli international units per liter. Um, and then possibly a free T4 as well. Pancreas, we check for insulin resistance with A1C, fasting glucose, and maybe a fasting insulin. Get uh, adrenal DHEA. I put a question mark because that's not standardly measured. And then uh, check for estradiol levels, and then definitely progesterone levels, and maybe testosterone levels as well. Uh, Anti-malarian hormone, AMH, is a measure of ovarian reserve, so that can also be used as an important measure there. Uh, we can do genetic testing if we suspect the genetic disorders, and then typically pelvic transvaginal ultrasound, uh, an x-ray of the uh, uterus and the ovaries, and then maybe a, even a hysterectomy or a laparoscopic surgical uh, inspection of the uh, ovaries and so forth. So that would all be part of the assessment of infertility. Typically for treatment, we're gonna follow the therapeutic order. Um, for patients who are trying to become pregnant, you know, if they wanna work with more naturopathic functional methods first, I start with level one, level two therapies for maybe six months, up to a year, depending on how uh, quickly they're trying to conceive. Uh, if within that time period it hasn't worked, then I go ahead and refer on to uh, ob and uh, or a woman's health nurse practitioner. Uh, and then for more advanced, uh, maybe a reproductive endocrinologist uh, to get their perspective on things as well. So we're gonna focus on our typical healthy lifestyle diet factors, supporting salutogenesis, so addressing any of the neuroendocrine patterns that we might see with HPA access or uh, insulin resistance and uh, or the low androgens, low estrogen. Uh, typically replacement therapy would be replacing thyroid, estrogen, progesterone, maybe gonadotropins. Uh, ovulation induction and in vitro procedures would be part of this. Uh, and usually we don't need level four therapies for infertility. Um, so that uh, hopes, hopefully gives you a little idea about how to think about female infertility. Uh, and then combined with the male infertility discussion, we can help work with couples if they're desiring to conceive. Okay, so that summarizes it for the majority of the kind of endocrine disorders of the female reproductive system. In the next video, I'll look at more menstrual disorders and um, do a more in-depth discussion of the different types of amenorrhea.